Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Prospect Corner presented by the Hockey Raiders. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the latest 2023 NHL draft rankings from our very own Peter Barracchini, as well as some other questions uh, related to the 2023 draft. Uh, so today, I'm joined by my co-host and fellow prospect analyst, Matthew Zator and Peter Barracchini. Peter, how are you doing today? Uh, doing great. Uh, I don't want to show my Homer side, but the Maple Leafs signing Matthew Nyes is huge right now. So really excited about that. And I can't wait to get my profit rankings ripped apart. So <laughs> let's go. That's, the plan. That's, the plan. <laughs> That's always the plan. Only here. negative comments. <laughs> that's the only thing we're doing today. Just, just tearing it shreds. Yeah, for sure. That, I mean, that's exciting news. The Nyes, Matthew Nyes mm-hmm. signing out of, out of the NCAA. It's going to be well, it could be a huge addition for Toronto. Who knows? We'll see how they how they use them. But that's Absolutely. exciting for sure. Matt, how are you doing today? Doing good. I well, pl- yeah. The, too bad Pedersen didn't get his hundredth point yesterday. But uh, as we record, but he's got ninety nine. Well, it's close. Um, but yeah, it's going well. I got a couple NCAA signings that the Canucks did as well, and they're looking really good so far. So um, excited to see where they and. I'll mention them a little later, just a spoiler. Ooh, nice, a little, <laughs> little teaser, not even a spoiler. All right. Um, yeah, that was the last home game for the Canucks, right? Would have been fun for Pedersen to hit 100 there, but um, yeah, got two or three games left, he'll he'll make it, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> otherwise, he's going to stay forever tied with JT Miller for the most points in the last decade or whatever for the Canucks. Yeah, yeah. Your fans love that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to jump in here. As I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, for the first first chunk here, we're going to talk about Peter's latest draft rankings, uh, where he ranked the top 96 prospects of the 2023 NHL draft. Make sure you check that out. You can follow along as you watch, if you like, or or just check it out after you listen here. Um, so since the players at the very top of this draft haven't really changed much since like September. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Peter, Peter, can you give us just like a real quick rundown of your top five? The order is kind of the only thing that can change a little bit at this point, but mm-hmm. then other than the fifth, the names are the same forever. But but who you got in the top five right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my top five is obviously you know this guy named Connor Bedard, another guy named Adam Fantilli, another guy <laughs> named Leo Carlson, another guy named Matt Bay Mitchcock. But there was a little slight change into my top five. Zach Benson creeped into my top five with Will Smith dropping the six. But then again, that's you know really tough because you have like really basically I would think three solid prospects that could jump into that fifth spot no matter what. So that's my top five right there. Yeah, for sure. I mean. That fifth spot is the only real intriguing one at this point. Um, it feels like the the drop off from four to five is significant, mm-hmm. although five is still there's tons of incredible prospects. Uh, Matt, what do you think about the order there? Do you have any any arguments over I don't know where Carlson lands or Michkov? Any thoughts? <laughs> Not really. Not I much. mean, this is a, a top <laughs> five that I would probably put. I mean, Benson is, I think, my five as well. I, it's it's not much different. I, I yeah, it, it, that's all. There's not much else to say. It's it, <laughs> yeah. It, this group is not going to change much. I, I, you know, unless there's a drastic something happens with one of them, but I don't foresee that. I think this is going to be a pretty close. I'd say the top four for sure. But like you said, the five can seems to change. Like you know, you had Will Smith at at five before, and then bumped up. Same thing here. Benson and Smith kind of moving, the kind of swapping. So. Uh, but overall, that five is probably going to be around what you're going to see in June. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've already talked to these these four or five guys to death, so I won't I won't spend any more time on it because yeah, w- we know them at this point. Those are the best guys. You know, a little bit of shuffling might happen on draft day, but nothing crazy. Uh, so, Peter, can you give us the rest of your top ten? Yeah, uh, six. I just mentioned Will Smith because Benson. Bumped him down. Seven is Oliver Moore. Eight is Andrew Crystal. 
Nine is Colby Barlow. And 10, by the slim of some margins, because I had trouble with this going back and forth, is uh, David Reinbacher. And honorable mention to number 11, Ryan Leonard, because it was very close, and I really couldn't decide decide between the two. Yeah, just just flip a coin. It makes makes things easier sometimes. (laughs) Nice. Okay, so Matt. Uh, looking at this top 10, is there anyone you'd have in the top 10 that didn't make it into Peter's list in the top 10? If it's Leonard, then, uh, you know, he gets a pass because like he said, that was a tough call. But um, is there anyone you'd maybe pull into the top 10? Do you feel like this is pretty solidified for you as well here? I'd say this is the top 10. I mean, Reinbacher and Leonard, yeah, you can you can kind of swap them. I mean, definitely Leonard can be in the top 10. Um I'd have a hard time with this too. I mean, it, it, those two are our top 10 prospects. I think, I mean, and Reinbacher, like we said, has pushed himself into that conversation and, you know, Axel Sandin Pelica, I mean, he, he's kind of dropped a little bit. I think it's just because of his, he's not as much of a two-way guy, um, but you know, he's not much further down Peter's list. He's at 15. So, mm-hmm. um, but Ryan Barker has pretty much, I think, solidified a spot in that 10 or even just, just maybe on the outside. So I really have no problem with this top 10. Like I said, I, I don't know if I would really change a lot if I was giving him a top 10. And yeah, that's pretty much what I would have. Yeah. So like, like I mentioned that the top five has been, or top four has been solid for a long time now. And it's just been, you know, the consensus kind of just slowly builds, builds on that. And yeah, I I agree. The top 10 seems pretty, pretty solid here. You can, you can argue some of the placements a little bit. Um, I'm a, I would have Reinbacher maybe a tiny bit higher, but not much at this point. And it it feels like he's the guy that um, on draft day is going to go higher than rankings probably just because, you know, big two-way right-hand defenseman that's a big thing um but also he's a really good player um the only person outside of the top 10 i'd maybe argue about you guys have kind of gotten to know this over the last month or two Uh, i'm a big nate danielson guy big fan of his game um you just have him at 13 so that's really not far out of there but Mm -hmm. i still have him in my top 10 um but really there's not a lot we can say about that a lot most of these guys are pretty solidly in there Crystal probably not going in the top 10 on draft day, although he definitely has the the Mm. skill, the talent for it, the shot, the hands, everything that you would want other than, you know, the height. If he was two inches taller, he'd be like a no doubt top 10 pick. Maybe he'd be number five. Who knows? Although Benson and Smith are no slouch. So, (laughs) you know, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I like the top 10 a lot. I wouldn't change a whole lot there either. So we're going to keep moving. Um, Peter, could you give us a few, a few notable players that have moved around lately? Like someone that's risen a bit, someone that's fallen a bit, anything like that. I mean, Brian Bacher from 23 in my January one to 10 is obviously a big one. And yep. obviously more from 22 all the way to number seven. That's very impressive considering the fact that, you know, it wasn't it, like the reason why I was a little bit low on him is because it, it's just so hard to rank this group because it is very, very difficult, especially with the USA team right now, how you have your top, the top line just absolutely dominating. But the way that Moore carried that second unit throughout the whole entire season, and he just started to improve every single time. And just his overall awareness, his smarts, his ability to make plays at a high pace and the speed itself too, the way that um, he uh, dictates the pace of play and how he like manages everything at, at a quick rate. It's absolutely phenomenal. And Definitely worthy of being a top 10 selection just based on the speed and the processing of the game alone. And also, you know, he's kind of playing, you know, in the backseat to that top line. So the fact that he was leading that charge is very impressive in my eyes. The second one, obviously, you mentioned him is Nate Danielson, too. Um, Had him believe 23. Third, 24th, and he's now 13th. And you, you, we mentioned mm-hmm. this with your rankings too, Logan. The fact that, you know, on a bat and like a really, really weak uh, Brandon Wee Kings team, he was an absolute offensive dynamo and the play was going through him. So he was the difference maker. He was taking charge. He showed that ability that no matter what situation the team is in, he's going to be the best player on the ice. And that to me is something that really stood out. Again, production may not seem like, you know, top 10, top 15 kind of thing. But again, overall smarts, that is something that really resonates well with me. And 
one defender that was previously in my top 50, but is now in my top 32 is Tom Willander. And it's just the, uh, his, he's got the offensive game down and he's just, he's very aggressive. He's got great speed and mobility on the back end, breakout passing, smart in the offensive zone. He's very aggressive with that mindset, but he's also very aggressive away from the puck too. Every single time I notice him, he's just an absolute standout. And the fact that, you know, some may still have him as an early second or in that spot. I just feel like the way that he's risen dictating that or having that complete two way game. So being, you know, having that flash of brilliance, but showing the smarts is really something that really resonated with me to put him into my top 32. So from 48 all the way up to 32, that is a big rise for him and uh, be on the lookout for his profile because I'm going to be writing that very, very soon. (laughs) Kind of, don't want to, you know, nice. just you know, promote myself a bit there, but I really do ah, love like Tom Willander. <laughs> I, I love his game too, but if there's anything this show loves, it's self-promotion. So go right ahead. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Keep going. Um, just kind of a, kind of just something that, that came to mind for me as you're going there, Peter. Um, is there anyone that you have in the first round that you feel like you're really, really banging the drum for? Someone that you think maybe is doesn't get enough attention. People aren't really thinking of them as a first rounder that, that you feel pretty strongly about someone you think maybe you're a lot higher on than consensus. Yeah, I'm, I've become a big fan of his throughout the whole entire season. And that's Oliver Bonk from the uh, London Knights. A lot of places have him ranked, you know, mid to early third, second round kind of spot. Hmm. Some have him late first, but I, you know, looking at, you know, the rankings over at Elite Prospects, a lot have him starting to come into that, you know, late first right now. So that's a really great sign. And he kind of seems to fly under the radar compared to other defensemen, especially with Reinbacher and Sandin Pelica. But I would put him as, you know, the next defenseman, even above Mikhail Goliayev based on his smarts decision-making. And again, that two-way game that I was raving about uh, to, uh, Tom Willander mm-hmm. and seeing that with Oliver Bonk, he's very, he isn't flashy. He's very calm and poised and he makes the right decisions every single time. Considering that he was, you know, in the greater Ontario junior hockey league before, which, you know, not even like junior a kind of thing. It's really impressive on the steps that he took to get to the OHL and have the season that he did where, you know, he was not a point per game, but, you know, 10 goals and 40 points as, you know, kind of a rookie defender in the season. It's very impressive. So to make those jumps, to make that kind of strides in his game, I think that is very, very great on his end and something that should get a lot of attention come draft day. Nice. I, I like Bonk. And just for reference, you have him at 27th here, mm-hmm. which is quite a lot higher than I've seen him in a lot of spots, but but I, I like Bonk a lot too. The name doesn't hurt. It's a fun name to say. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> so next up here, uh, Matt and I are going to call out one ranking on in your latest edition here that we really agree with and one we don't agree with quite so much, something we disagree with a little. Yeah. And we'll give you a chance to respond, Peter. Um, I'll go first. So for one I agree with, I definitely agree with the Riley Height love. You got him ranked at 14th, which is right around where mm-hmm. I – I like him in that range too. Um, great in the neutral zone. He's going to create like a ton of controlled zone entries uh, in the NHL. He does it in juniors. He wins tons of face-offs, which is wild for someone who just turned 18. He's like the yeah. go-to face-off man for Prince George Cougars. Uh, he's a really great playmaker. He's good at pretty much everything. I like him a lot. Um, I'm a big fan of, big fan of that ranking. And then one that I, I don't, agree with quite so much just because i have him a lot higher is oscar fisker molgard you've got him at 51st i believe um 51 yeah 51 and i've already changed my mind a bit since my last rankings came out um so i can't i can't complain too much but um i'm (laughs) I'm thinking he's going to be getting into the mid 30s for me probably maybe not quite the first round but he's getting close there for me Mm -hmm. he's just such a complete defensive player already um as a middle six forward middle six center in the shl um i just think he's he's got a lot of uh, projectable nhl skills as a bottom six penalty killer at least um if the nhl team that takes him can can work out some of the offense and can help help him build on that 
there's some real potential there. Although, you know, that doesn't always work out. I still see, still see a lot in his game. So I, I, um, I like him a little higher than that, but I don't blame you at all. Cause the offense is not really there at all. So can't blame you. Um, I'll, I'll allow you a chance to to respond. So I'm not just yelling at you here. No, no, not a, yeah. yeah you, you know, I think I'm just going to, you know, leave the chat right now, but uh, yeah. All right, good night. <laughs> um, yeah, no height. I like, he's always been a top 15 for me. There's no doubt about that. And before I get into uh Fisker Molgard, I believe I kind of missed like some followers last time too. Um, oh yeah. In the previous mm-hmm. question. So I'm just going to quickly run over that. Uh, Go Kasper Halton and, um, is one player that I had at 19 before has dropped to the forties. Consistency isn't there, but I believe he has dealt with some injuries this season as well, but I still can't get over the fact that he's this power forward, heavy hitting, hard shooting type of player that some team is going to take a chance on early on in the draft or, you know, early second because of the power and the offensive frame that he has. So I think still a little bit low on him, but he fell because of that and Two of them, two elephants in the room are going to be Emilio Arventi and Cam Allen, both for the same thing that their consistency just hasn't been there all season. And decision making away from the puck with the puck is just kind of all over the place right now. So um, it's it's really interesting because uh, your Arventi was a stand, both, both your Arventi and Allen were standouts at the uh, Helenka Gretzky Cup. I thought played both of them, I thought played really well. Um, Allen now dropped to 75, Yarventi 79. I think someone there's going to be a chance that maybe Allen goes higher up because someone is still going to probably think that they they could get back to that untapped potential or potential that he had. Um, but we'll see with that. And Yarventi, again, just the inconsistencies to his game. Those are two that fell pretty low for me. Mm-hmm. And now, now to the real question about um, Oscar Fisker Molgard, and yeah, I, I agree. I, I I do love his steady uh, defensive game. He's very very complete. Um, again, it's just the offensive potential and ceiling that he has that just makes him in that middle of the second round for me. Again, like you said, I do like if there's a team that can you know get that production out and kind of turn him into more of like a you know middle six second line winger I think that his sock will rise up but until then I, I I agree with you I think he may rise up next time but this was kind of more of a safe bet for me based on his overall game of where he's at right now but I'm liking what I'm seeing from him yeah that's totally fair I uh I I, I get the questions with his offense for sure mm-hmm. um Matt I'll give you a chance here uh call out some of these rankings here something you agree with something you disagree with in peter's latest rankings what do you got matt Be well, nice. i really like the samuel hanzik at 23 i i think yeah. uh, he's definitely a first round guy i know there's rankings around that has him have him in the second round but uh love seeing him in the first round and uh, any vancouver giants i love getting having them get drafted into the nhl so uh, even though the canucks never picked them but uh, even though they're in their backyard, I don't get it. But <laughs> uh, actually not in their backyard. They're just right beside them. They're not that far down the road. Um, but yeah, Hanzik is is sure. I think he's a first round talent, like you said, in your rankings there. 20, you know, 23. Um, that's a playoff team's going to get this guy. And it's, yeah. a, you know, that's a pretty good talent to get at 23. Um, has all the things that I love about in a player that high energy competitive nature that he's got um, work ethic, all that. And, you know, that I've always draw, I always drawn to those types of players. So uh, loving it. He's a first round pick uh, for you, for you there. Um, one I don't agree with, and you can probably guess who it is. Matthew Wood at 17. I don't like him at beyond the <laughs> top 15. He should be in the top 15. Yeah. Although it's not that far out. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I really love him as a player and I I'm actually hoping he's a, maybe around this point because the Canucks have a better chance of drafting him if they do. <laughs> um, but yeah, not so much with him. And then I'll, I'll throw out another one. That's a bit too low. I mean, again, it's not too bad, but Gavin Brindley as a second round pick. I think he's more of a first rounder yeah. again, for the fact of his skill and his work ethic and the fact that I think he'll become, he's going to become a top six player in the NHL and, Although other a lot of second rounders obviously do that. Um, but I think he's got first round talent. And I think probably why he's in the second round for you and probably for a lot of people is his size. So 
Um, so those two guys I'll probably say is ones I kind of don't agree with, although it's not a crazy disagreement. Yeah. Peter, you got any thoughts on, on those picks there? Yeah. Uh, again, if I wasn't going to leave before, I'm going to leave right now. Not joking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. With, with Hanslick, it took a while for me to get a read on him. I, I will say that he was one of, there's always a player in every single draft where you're just not sure about somebody, but then as you get to see more of him play. And even so, I think, you know, the way that he progressed at the beginning of the year and the tournament that he had, he was very noticeable at the world juniors before mm-hmm. that injury. And I think that's what really took note of, since then but then even when he came back he was just on an absolute tear so um i had I had to have him in that first it took a while for me to get on that you know hype train for hansik but you know i i can see why right now and yeah for me for Ma- the matthew wood thing it, it's i t- i initially had shala ahead of wood but because of what he did as that you know freshman at uconn um with the playmaking, how he's developing that into his game right now, I think it's really solid what he's doing. So yeah, um, it was really hard for me to have him outside the top 15 because his shot is elite. It is powerful. It's one of the best in this class. And that's a reason why someone could take him in the top 15. So um, could wholeheartedly understand why 17 may be a little bit too low. Um, and for Brindley, it's not even so much the size factor. I just... I, I, again, it's, it's one of those players that you, you not necessarily trying to have a hard time to read, but it's just that the depth of the players that I like ahead of Brindley, although, you know, some players are going to have Brindley over who I like, and that's totally fine. But um, it's just for me right now. And because he's teetering on that edge of the early second, late first, um, I have Trey Augustine as my third, as my top goaltender and in the first round, mm-hmm. chances are if, you know, the U18 championship is coming up and I know we're going to get to that in a bit, obviously I want to see chances are he's probably going to be on that team. I want to see what he can do there as well. So there may be some changing, some shifting of the guard, what have you about some of those players that are second round that could jump into the first. And Brindley is definitely one of those guys that, you know, I, I love his energy. I love his ability to, you know, still play an aggressive style despite his size. He's very energetic. He's a workhorse. He doesn't stop going. That definitely could appeal to a team and make him a first round pick. Mm. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think also like it it does sort of, I have Brindley in the first round, but I also, I, he feels like the kind of person that um uh, a GM would try to like game the draft Mm -hmm. They would like assume no one else is going to take them and let them fall a little further, (laughs) even though they want him. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see someone like a team with maybe one or two picks in the draft in the first round to just wait him out to see if he, if he falls to them in the second, maybe. Um, But you never know. I don't know. We'll, Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens with him. (laughs) Um, I I do want to say on Matt Wood. um, I've, I have no idea what to expect from NHL GMs on draft day with Matt Wood um, <laughs> because like the size, the shot and the hands and the production in the NCAA is mm-hmm. the youngest player in college in mm-hmm. men's college hockey this year is absurd. Um, but the skating troubles me. However, mm-hmm. I <laughs> know for a fact there are NHL teams that look at his skating and are like, oh, we can fix that. We yeah, can yeah. deal with that. Um, it's just where are those teams picking mm-hmm. and what's the talent level of the players around um, at that point. But I, I would, I wouldn't be shocked to see him go in the top 10 just because of that size and the shot and the skill. Yeah. If a team thinks they can work out the skating, um, I don't, I don't pick him. I don't put him there right now. I wouldn't rank him there because the skating hasn't improved yet. If you know, like a year from now, if I'm ranking drafted prospects and his skating is improving a ton, maybe with another year in college, Mm -hmm. then obviously he'll, he'll start rising up pretty Mm -hmm. quick because he's got a pretty exciting uh, toolbox there. Pretty, pretty exciting group of skills, but um, I have no idea what to expect from him. He might end up in the, you know, like 12 to 18 range. You could go higher. We'll, we'll Mm -hmm. have to wait and see, but I'm I'm very curious about that. Yeah. It also kind of feels like the Connor Geeky situation last year where he did have, you know, that size of playmaking abilities, the soft hands in tight areas. 
not so much a shot, but, you know, certain aspects and skills as offensive game that Matthew Wood has, but his skating and his stride still seems a little bit off. But, you know, some team, uh, I believe it was the Coyotes that took him. So mm, yeah. um, there's the possibility that, you know, there is somebody there that's going to look at the offensive production and say that's more of a reason why to take him this high in the top 15 spot, just like the Coyotes did with Geeky at 11 and say, hey, you know what? We need a goal scorer. Matthew Wood could be just that. Yeah, and Geeky going 11th. I mean, <laughs> I'm a bigger fan of Matt Wood than Connor Geeky. So, yeah. you yeah. know, he could he could, <laughs> he could be a big riser. He could surprise people. Yeah, I don't know. That would I know that would excite you a lot, Matt. Um, so <laughs> we'll, I'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed for it. Um, okay, so I've got a couple quick fire questions for you guys here. Um, and these ones are, they're not like the most difficult thing in the world because it doesn't matter because we're just guessing random things, but, um, I'm going to go first to answer them just to give you guys an extra second to answer. So don't include the, like the top, top end guys in the draft. Cause this, that would make these questions way too easy. Um, <laughs> but aside from those guys, aside from like top five, top 10, roughly who is a player in Peter's rankings that you think will be drafted how do I even phrase this question? <laughs> Which player in Peter's rankings do you think is uh, going to be drafted the closest to the spot Peter ranked them? So the number lines up the best. So for closest, I'm going to say Michael Harabal, uh, just mm-hmm. oh, just on a wing and a prayer. Uh, Peter, you have him ranked 47th overall, and he was you know top goalie coming into the year for most people. Had a bit of a uninspiring season in the ushl um but middle of the second round for a goalie with nhl goaltender size with some of the technique at least um that's got to excite some teams and there's only so many great goalies i mean there's three or four maybe depending on your opinion on them uh but i w- i think he's probably going to go in that range pretty close to that so that's my bet michael harabel 47th overall i'll say he he ends up pretty close to that um so peter i'll i'll come to you next here which player in your rankings do you think will actually be drafted the closest to your <laughs> rankings yeah i i honestly think it's going to be otto stenberg at 25 i Ooh. believe that Again, it all goes back to the offensive production. I know offensive production is not everything for young players this age, especially when, you know, they're going through the ranks or moving up in, you know, uh, going back and forth between junior and the SHL. And, you know, Stenberg had really great production in the J20 level. Um, uh, computer was freezing there for a second. Uh, 26 points in 29 games with uh, Frolunda. And then, you know, three points in 23 games, obviously teams are going to look at that. But then again, you know, you, all these prospects are going to fight to get ice time. It's not going to be there and consistency is going to drop off a bit. But considering his 200 foot game, 200 foot game, the the skill that he has in transition and the speed to push defenders back, the smarts there and just his overall consistency with his decision making. It's going to be smart, and I think he's going to fall as a result, but some team is going to look at that and say, hey, you know, he reads the game at a quick pace and at an NHL level. I think right now this is a player that we're going to take here, and he's going to drop as a result of some some factors as well. And even the fact that he's 5'11", obviously I kind of think back to the whole Liam Ogren situation where – I don't know why he should have been a top 15 pick and he fell to just 19th overall, I believe. Mm. So I think right now Stenberg may fall a little bit further down, but then again, you know, a player that could play center wing can do it all has a skill set when he does have the puck and he's smart away from it. I don't know. I I feel like he's just going to fall for some reason. Nice. I like that pick. That's a, that's a fun one. Um, Matt, who do you have uh, where their draft slot will line up with Peter's rankings here? I'm going to go with Gabe Perot at 20. I think he's he's going to be around that point. Again, same same thing. I think he's he's definitely a top 15, top 10, maybe even a top 10 talent. But his size, I think, is just going to push him down. And it's unfortunate that that's going to happen. But I think he's going to be in a spot where, like, again, a playoff team's going to get this guy. And, uh, and that's, <laughs> you know, for a team that could potentially – 
be going in and have a chance at the Stanley Cup and getting a guy like Gabe Perot at 20. Uh, that's a pretty good uh, guy to have when you're not winning the cup. Because <laughs> when you're getting this guy, uh-huh. you won't have won the cup, obviously. But, uh, you know, at, at 20, he's just such a, I like I said, I think he's a, 10, a top 10, 15 pick, but in talent level. But unfortunately, the size still is a factor for a lot of teams. And you see that every year where guys drop. And, you know, Cole Caulfield dropping further than he should have with his talent level and um, so many other undersized guys going into the second round because of that. So I think Perot is going to be going around 20 here. Okay. Yeah. I like that one too. I, I, it would make me a little sad to see him drop too far. Cause I yeah. just don't think it makes sense. And also it kind of hurts to see playoff teams getting great players, but yeah. <laughs> with, with the talent in this class, it's bound to happen. You're going to look at, any team selecting in the first round and you'll be like, Ooh, they did pretty well unless they you know, completely botched <laughs> the pick, but we'll see. <laughs> um, okay. So next quick fire question is the opposite. So again, kind of just don't include the top 10 guys. I mean, that wouldn't even help you in this question, <laughs> but who's a player that you think will be drafted the furthest from Peter's ranking of them either because like Peter, you've got them at 15 and then they fall due to size or something um this is basically how much what's a player that you think peter and nhl general managers disagree on the most <laughs> um, <laughs> or maybe someone that you don't think super highly of like you were talking about um casper halton and, and how he could be drafted a lot earlier than you've got him ranked um you know size shot hits whatever that that stuff can can lead to a player jumping pretty high so i'll go again first here Um, The player that I think will be uh, drafted the furthest away from your ranking, I guess you could also pick an unranked player, but I'm picking Gavin McCarthy. You've got him ranked 95th, plays for Mm -hmm. the, I believe the Muskegon Lumberjacks. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not to say that name of that city Um, in the USHL. Um, He's a big right shot D, showed actually pretty good offense, despite the points not really showing up too much. I think he's roughly like, two thirds a point per game in the USHL, which is good. Not amazing. Um, I, I think, you know, being a right shot D being big skating. Well, um, I, I really think he could start to rise further and further. I wouldn't be shocked to see him go in the first round just because that is a spot that teams need players um, and kind of defense, especially feels like where teams make reaches sometimes like towards the, middle late first round and size helps um but i actually think he's pretty pretty good i've been looking into his game a lot more lately um i'm a big fan of his to be uh just full disclosure i missed him entirely on my last rankings (laughs) did not make my 96 so you're already ahead of me here but i think he could easily (laughs) jump into the top 50 um on draft day so that that's my pick evan mccarthy i think he'll he'll have a bit of a gap there um, Matt, who would your pick be? There's a, uh, my gosh, I, this one I had to think on a bit. Um, but I'm going to go with Aiden Fink. I think he's going to be higher. Woo! Um, he's at 87 where you got him at 87th. I think he could be a, a second round pick, um, because of just the high skill level that he's got and the work ethic and the production he's got. I, I mean, I know in a league it's different. I mean, it's a different league compared to other ones, but, um, I think a team will take a swing on him in the second round just because that skill level is, is insane. Um, so I, I'm going to go with Fink. I, I think, uh, I think he could end up being in the second round instead of the third. You know, I like Fink. So if you say his name, I'm on, <laughs> I'm, I'm on board with it. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Who's a player that you think will be drafted in the, the furthest away from the spot that you ranked them? Um. This is a I'm gonna pick one player that could that could either go higher or lower from where I have them. Uh can I do that? Absolutely. <laughs> then That's I am perfect. picking <laughs> then I am picking Quentin Musty from the Sudbury Wolves because oh, yeah. to me he seems like the big wild card mm-hmm. of this draft. You know, power forward like game, great size, great drive, great hands, great shot. He has the offensive tools, but his decision making with the puck. And that was a big knock on him, uh, you know, coming into the season with U18s, how he was sometimes, you know, trying to do a bit too much. It still persisted throughout the season. He's gotten better. But if he's able to try and kick some of those bad habits out, 
he's going to be a riser and teams are going to look at that improvement to his game. If it's still kind of up in the air and teams are very wary about that, he could fall as a result of him being a late first and could fall into the second round. So that is one player where I'm kind of on the fence with. And one player that has really caught my eye is Matthew Soto. And I think he can rise up possibly. Uh, I have him 70th uh, uh, early third, but he could probably jump in and be a late second. Um, obviously the front knacks, um, with their team didn't quite have the season they expected. It was kind of, you know, very, you know, inconsistent. I'm just going to leave it at that. And Matthew Soto was leading the team in 40 with 42 points in 54 games. So, um, he showed some great promise this season. I think I thought he showed great composure. He's very quick, very smart, uh, high energy and great awareness. I think that's something that a team can look at and say, Hey, you know what? He, he's got some potential right here. We could probably take him a little bit higher than, you know, just an early third. Yeah, for sure. Those, those are some great picks as well. There's, there's plenty of wild cards still <laughs> left. I, I like the, the musty pick there. Um, mm-hmm. Where did you have him ranked at the end here? Uh, well, 28th. 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 Yeah. He feels like someone that, if he if he shows out well, if he's at the U18s, maybe, um, you know, he could genuinely jump into the top 16, one of those lottery picks. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a little uninspiring, teams are a little nervous about him, he could fall into the second, no doubt. Um, so that'll be an interesting storyline to watch and actually kind of fits with the question we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but first, I'm just going to mention that today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Hockeypedia. Have you ever been looking for details on a player that just competed at the World Junior Championship? Do you want to know who owns the New York Rangers? What Do you ever wonder what the NHL awards are and what their history is, who they're named after, stuff like that? If you're interested in these or any other hockey-related questions, make sure you check out and bookmark the Hockey Writers Hockeypedia. It's an ever-growing collection of hockey resources that is invaluable to any fan looking for information. Check for a link in the show description below and dive in today. All right, so on the back half of the show here, we're just going to talk about 2023 draft a little bit. Um, So first off, I just kind of wanted to open the floor for us to talk about some prospects that we like, but haven't really talked about much. So I'm going to come to you first, Peter. Is there a first round talent level player, roughly, in your eyes at least, that you haven't talked about a ton yet this year, maybe on the podcast um that you want to give a little love to give a little attention um and if so tell us what makes them special why you think they're a first round or something like that um i may have mentioned them a few times but not as in depth about as i would like to and that's carson raykoff from the kitchener rangers i mean i already went and i was going to pick tom willander but i already explained why (laughs) i i really like him and why he was a riser but carson raykoff this season was just obviously the kitchener rangers are a deep deep team you know you got francesco pinelli uh they've added a lot of players at the deadline too they even have philip Mejar. they got danny jokin on the team francesco R. curry so they were they were buying to go for a deep playoff run but you know raykov to me is a standout player that can have a two-way game can play both center and wing and he's got a fantastic shot i mean he can rip the puck very very well great accuracy and power with his release um I, I I really think that this season a lot of people are sleeping on him because of the fact that maybe his production isn't as great. Fifty nine points in sixty eight games, although that was second overall to Pinelli, who had ninety and sixty. But I think that Rakoff, considering how you know he had a decent rookie season last year, thirty three and sixty five, he expanded on that. I I think there's going to be a time where next season is going to be even better, and he's going to build on what he has right now because he has that dynamicism, that work ethic, that ability to make life difficult for the opponents as well. Um, very smart, very calculated. Um, I, I I believe I read somewhere that his game is kind of similar to that of Mike Richards, but I think a little bit more offensive upside given his ability to score goals. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've I've been a bit, I was really took note of him at that U18 or the Helenka Gretzky cup kept watching him all the season. And I've really liked his consistency from that point. So Carson Rakoff is one player that 
I probably have mentioned quite a bit, but not go in depth. But this is one player that I'm really uh, excited for uh, come the draft day. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great pick there. And that team in general, the Rangers mm-hmm. have been. You said they were they were loading up for a playoff run, and uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't looking so hot, you know, coming in as the eighth seed in the OHL yeah. playoffs. But they just swept the the number one seed, Windsor Spitfires. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the other night they finished them off. So uh, they're, they're right on track for that long playoff run you mentioned. Um, yeah. Matt, who's, who's a, a player uh, anyway, I guess in this draft that you haven't had the chance to talk too much about yet um, that you'd like to, to give a little shine to today. Well, Peter, you mentioned him before Quentin musty. I was going to mention him in this question. I, and I'll, I'll go, I'll talk about why I like him. I, I think, you know, a lot of it is that, that dynamic play that he got and that power forwards mentality, you know, if that's the one thing about the NHL, they don't, I don't think the NHL is a lot of those pure power forwards anymore. Um, I mean, they have to be that hybrid. And I think Musty's got that he's, he's going to be able to perform as a power forward in the NHL, at least what the modern day power forward is. Um, you can't be just a big guy that uh, has a skating ability. You got to be able to be dynamic as well. And I think Musty's got that. Um, and then of course, having that, that accurate shot and that, uh, that ability to score that way as well. Um, but yeah, Musty, I haven't really talked about, uh, I don't think I've mentioned him, uh, on the, on the show before, but he's very intriguing. Just, just looking at a little bit more about him uh, over the last um, few days here. And, you know, that's, that's one thing, you know, you've got him at towards the end of the first round. I think, like you say, he could, he could go up and down. And um, I think, you know, I, like I guess I think he's got that potential to be a power forward in the NHL, at least what the definition of a power forward is right now. So I really like Musty. I think he's going to end up being a first round pick, but uh, it'll just depend on where that is in the first round. Yeah, for sure. He probably first rounder, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. Cause that's, <laughs> he's a really exciting prospect for sure. Um, as we said earlier, he'll be able, he'll be a fun one to watch in the next couple months. Um, I mean, going forward as well, especially if he puts some, puts a couple things together, look, learns a few lessons. Yeah. Um, someone that I, I want to talk about that. I don't think, I know I've talked about him, but not enough because I'm getting more and more excited about him and I just can't stop it. So <laughs> we talked about him briefly, Samuel Hanzik. Um, I am a Samuel Hanzik truther. I think he is <laughs> very least a top 20 pick. I think in my next rankings, he might be top 16. Um, he's big. He's just a hair under six foot four. Uh, he's played a few games at center, which, you know, NHL teams love, but he's probably a winger um, unless, you know, his team decides that they want him as a center and he goes back to juniors for a full year down the middle or something. But this is his first year in the WHL with the Vancouver Giants. Um, Just absolutely crushed it. (laughs) Like before he went to the World Juniors and got injured, he was in the top 10 in scoring in the WHL in his first year there. Usually there's a bit of an adjustment period for North American players going to Europe or European players come to North America. But his game is just perfectly suited. Um, Just a big, fast, four-checking winger. Um, he's going to be a two-way guy in the NHL, probably, probably kill penalties. Mm-hmm. He's got good hands, especially in traffic, um, for someone that size. And he, he really fits the profile of someone that in a, in a weaker draft class, I could see, um, jumping into the top 10, um, if a team got excited by him. Um, I don't think that's happening this year, but, but in, in a regular year, I wouldn't be shocked. I'm um, I'm a really big fan of his. Um, yeah, every time I watch him, he just rises up my board a little bit. So that hasn't stopped yet. Um, yeah, Samuel Hanzek's mine. So I've got another question here for you guys. Um, and I'll start with you this time, Matt. Who's a prospect that you don't think will go until at least the second round or later, however late you want, um, that you think will be a good pickup? We're going to do an episode a little later on, closer to the draft some some late round picks that would be uh some prospects that will probably go a little later in the draft that could be really really exciting um so just a taste here who's who's one prospect you think is going to go a little later that you're excited about well i i'm pretty sure i've mentioned him um before and that is 
Mazden Leslie, the Vancouver Giants. And mm-hmm. I don't know why he's not on a lot of these rankings where he's he kind of bounces around third round, maybe around there. I don't know if you've got him, um, Peter, anywhere on your rankings. I'm trying to see if I can find him. Um, but yeah, he's biggest thing. He's a right hand shot. He's a right hand shot defense. And he's he's one of those mobile um great offensive defensemen at 50 points uh, this season uh, for the giants and, you know, a couple assists in the playoffs, even though they got swept uh, it, you know, the, the giants are, uh, they seem to have so few, well, you we mentioned Hansik already and uh, Leslie, mm-hmm. he's been impressing. I've seen a bunch of clips. He just runs over my Twitter feed a lot. So I'm like, okay, there he is again. So I, I, I've been noticing him a bit. Uh, yep. Making really great, great plays at the blue line with his passing and his vision and playmaking. And I think that's, and he's got a, an ability to score goals as well. So I think whoever gets this guy, and I think it'll be a third round maybe, um, is going to get a heck of a defenseman that's going to end up being uh, in a, like five, six years down the road is going to be an, a heck of a top four defenseman. So I'm going with Leslie on this one. Nice. I, I like that pick. He's definitely someone that it's kind of weird that he's ranked low. Um, but if he ends up going in that range, it's going to be a pretty solid pickup for sure. Especially just with, you know, the lack of right-handed defensemen yes. <laughs> in every team's prospect pool, basically. Um, I'll go next here. My second round or later pick to look at, look for right now. I guess you shouldn't look for him right now unless you're watching the BCHL playoffs. It's Idar Suniev, who plays for the mm. Penticton V's in the BCHL. Uh, so his teammate is Bradley Nadeau, who we've talked about at length. Um, I see him as a first round pick some somewhere around there. At very least, I like Nadeau a lot. His goal scoring. Um, and, and we talk about how Nadeau doesn't get enough attention. But Suniev is not far behind in terms of points, at least. And he was tied with Nadeau for goals. And we do not talk about Suniev enough. Um, he's a very different player than Nado. Instead of being undersized, he is a big boy and he shoots hard. Uh, he's got a really great shot. He scored the same amount of goals as Nado, which tied them both for the lead in the BCHL. And he was the league's third highest scorer overall. Um, he's a big Russian winger, heavy shot, pretty good hands. Um, everything he does looks great in the BCHL. So it can be a little tough to like parse out the kind of things that aren't going to fly when he's against tougher competition. Um, his skating is the biggest worry for me watching his game. He's not very agile. If he loses the puck and he has to turn around to, to go chase the play, which he does, he competes pretty hard. Uh, he takes a real wide berth. It looks like I'm skating out there. Um, <laughs> no, he's still better than me. No doubt. Um, the offense is very exciting. Um, this skating will need work, but Suniev is very exciting. I, I think he could be a second round pick, even though he doesn't, isn't getting a ton of attention. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of his. Um, Peter, I'll come to you last here. Who's a prospect that you don't think will go until at least the second round, maybe later, uh, that you think would be a pretty valuable pick? Uh, it's probably the f- perfect time to say this. And uh, kind of last week when we were talking about like, you know, great names in the draft, I'm going to pick okay. Matthew Mania. And I <laughs> went back and listened nice. to other broadcasts and it is Mania, not Mania. I don't know why I thought I heard both, but <laughs> from the few that I've heard, it is Mania. But um, to the, you know, Matthew Mania signs. Going crazy <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so but, oh, but his <laughs> overall game, I am just absolutely happy with. Um, obviously, you know, more of an offensive minded defenseman. Defensive game is still a work in progress, but his off the way that he moves the puck in transition, his breakout passing, his shot, the way that he can, you know, uh, excel in you know his pinches and reads in the offensive zone. I'm liking what he's able to do so far, and um. You know, he's got great hands and he can move it at uh, move the puck at a quick pace. Um, He's always scanning for passing lanes, you know, trying to find those cross scenes, connecting with teammates. And I noticed that he doesn't quite panic. You know, he yeah, he can make some high risk plays and some high risk moves, but he seems confident in everything that he does. And obviously he has that high risk, high reward kind of uh, factor going for him. 
But, you know, there's going to be a team that's going to love that high risk, but he's very confident with the decisions that he makes. And yeah, it can come back to bite him and the team and it can lead to a turnover. I think he needs to be a little bit smart, but he's very deceptive, very quick and very agile with his skating as well. So um, currently I have him as, you know, kind of a mid to late third round, but some teams see uh, some potential in him. They could probably be something that benefits them and take him a little bit higher. Yeah, I I love Matthew Mania because his name perfectly describes his game. It's just mania out yeah. there. It's just kind of chaos a little yeah. bit. <laughs> exactly. um, if you can learn to control that a bit, then it could be very exciting um, and not be as chaotic and scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's fun that his name describes his game pretty well like that. <laughs> That's a, a great call there, Peter. Great call out. Um, okay, lastly here, last question. As we record this episode, the 2023 U18 World Junior Championships are just over 10 days away. Uh, most of the rosters or even the camp rosters, which will be whittled down a bit, haven't been announced yet. Um, so some of this will just be guesses, but I'll get you guys to give your best guesses, someone that you think will be there. Um Matt, I'll come to you first. Um, who are some prospects that you think have the most riding on this tournament that this could could make or break their draft stock? Oh, um, there's, I mean, all of them, the one thing about these tournaments, and I don't have a really specific player, but I one thing about these under 18 tournaments, they can boost stock. Like, Look at a uh, prime example is Danilo Klimovic um, back mm-hmm. in what, a couple of seasons, couple of years mm-hmm. ago. And yeah. he wasn't on anyone's radar until that, that tournament. And he just lit it up and ended up being a second round pick. Now the decision of should have, he have been a second round pick that's still up in the air. Cause he's not really doing a lot in the AHL right now, but I mean, he's improving every game. So, I mean, and that he could potentially be, he's got high skill. I mean, that's the one thing, but that's the thing, what it can do for these tournaments they, that some players can yeah. just be like, well, who is this guy? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, OK, <laughs> maybe we yeah. should look closer at him. Um, so I, I don't have anyone specific right now. I think I think guys may maybe guys like uh, I mean, solidify spots is like um, Axel Sand and Pelica, maybe a guy like that because he's so yeah. You know, especially when you're going with Reinbacher, he could maybe push himself up closer because how he played the World Juniors, um, he is still eligible yeah. for the U18s. I'm hoping I'm saying <laughs> he would I believe be. so. Um, so I mean, yeah, anyone anyone that's kind of on a borderline of being like a first round pick could push themselves into a first round or even mm-hmm. push themselves into from from the abyss up into a second round pick. <laughs> like I love that word. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. I, I I think I think it's going to be huge for everyone in here. Um, I mean, you won't see. I don't think there's going to be much movement about the really high guys. I mean, you know what they're going to do, but I think it's going to be those ones towards the fir- end of the first round, um, even like lower down that could push mm-hmm. themselves into a conversation being a second round or even higher. Yeah, for sure. And that that Klimovich point is is a really good point. Um, you really just need you just need to convince one general manager or one <laughs> scouting staff. That's all you have to do. You don't have to convince every every team that you're a first rounder or a second rounder. You can you can come from the abyss and just uh, <laughs> impress one team enough to to you know jump significantly. Um, I'm gonna go with one player here that has been confirmed for the tournament, or at least for the uh, early teams. Uh, the camp teams and then one that hasn't been but I think will probably make the team uh, the one that has made the team is goaltender Michael Robble who I mentioned earlier uh, for team Czechia yeah the year is the consensus top goalie at least in most circles yeah. um, and has dropped a bit after a season in the USHL uh, really hot start like crazy first four or five games I think if I remember correctly and then and then really just came back to earth pretty quick uh, the performance has not been there. The frame and the tools are there, but um, a good showing at this tournament for him, if he can take the starters net for Czechia, I think that could, would go a long way to reestablish him as maybe the top goalie again. Um, there's competition, Trey Augustine, Carson Bjarnason, Um, but 
I think this would go a long way for that. Um, could bump him into the first round, even um, if a team is looking for for a new top goalie prospect. And then one who I'm kind of projecting to make it, um, and I feel pretty confident in the pick, is Alex Siernik for Slovakia. He played for the U20 team at mm-hmm. the World Juniors, which is why I think he'll be <laughs> asked to join this team. <laughs> Um, he's been quite good in the Allsvenskan this year in Sweden, uh, but he hasn't got a whole lot of hype, even though he's scored 0.48 points per game, which you can compare to Dalibor Dvorsky, who has 0.37 points per game. Um, obviously, different positions, different players. I still think Dvorsky is a much better player than Siernik, but um, I think this would this could be a big tournament for Siernik, and he could become a first-rounder in some people's eyes. He was good, not great at the U-20s while he was, I believe, 17 at the time of the tournament. Um, So that's impressive. Just being okay at that tournament when you're that young (laughs) is impressive. Um, So going against significantly younger competition, I think he could could, uh, improve his stock quite a bit. Um, Peter, is there anyone that uh, you think has a lot riding on this U-18 Worlds coming up here? Uh, first player kind of like you, I'm going to check it and I'm going to say Edward Shala. And it's mainly because of, you know, how he had that standout, Ivan, uh, Helenka Gretzky cup, how he mm-hmm. did get off to a good start average world juniors. And then the play kind of sort of dipped. I think this is right now where whatever, like, you know, doubt that has been placed on his game because he's such a smart player and that he can dictate and take control of a shift. I think this is going to be a huge moment for him. I think this is going to be a moment where, or a tournament where, yeah, he probably just dealt with some hiccups in the road, but this is going to be one of those tournaments where he's going to stand out and he's going to shine and he's going to be on full display of what he's able to accomplish and what he can do. The other one that I'm going for is Team Canada probably hasn't come out with their roster, but the Kelowna Rockets were eliminated. And I think I know where you guys are. Uh, I, I'm going with this. <laughs> that is Andrew Crystal. You know, oh. it's, you know considering 16th, 16th among uh, central scouting, among North American skaters. Um, we talked about the height factor, how that's going to be huge. But considering how this is a player that was the th- top you know, WHL draft eligible player or fourth, sorry, um, to have a, you know, over 90 points, Bedard, Benson, Height, and Crystal, you know, all draft eligible, all hit the 90 uh, points mark. Crystal's playmaking, his shot, his transitional game is, is on point. I think it's what teams want in a competitive skilled uh, right wing player. Um, Obviously, you know, maybe some defensive play, his his ability to cheat on certain aspects and zone exits can be evident, but that's something that you could work out of. And I think if he's going to be on Team Canada, he's going to be a dynamite offensive powerhouse or a factor for this team going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I sure hope he, he plays for Team Canada. I don't see why he wouldn't, but that, that would be a ton of fun to watch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, all right. I've just got one quick fire question here, and it's a just dead simple you guys are gonna have no problem with this one just what do you think um so i guess probably viewers will um uh, or listeners will know the answer before we do because it hasn't happened yet so connor bedard and the regina pats although it's mostly just connor bedard and then a bunch of other guys um, are in the whl playoffs right now and um have done surprisingly well bedard has I believe 19 points in the first six games, which is over three (laughs) points per game, 11 goals in six games. So he's playing, you know, as you'd expect for Connor Bedard at this point, Um, actually even higher than that though. He's, he's been unreal. Yeah. Um, Just when you think he couldn't elevate his game, he elevates his game. (laughs) That's right. He just keeps going Um, against the Saskatoon blades. If I remember correctly, they're going to game seven. I'm not sure which day it's on. It could even be tonight while we're recording this. Uh, who do you think wins that series? It's going to game seven. Who do you think wins that series? And why is Connor Bedard going to score like five goals in this last game? <laughs> that second part isn't part of the question. That's just my my thoughts. Um, Matt, who's going to win this game? Is it going to be Bedard or is it going to be the Blades? <laughs> it's, um, or someone else. Just for, for reference, it is, it is tomorrow on Monday okay. um, as we record this. So I'm going to say... Connor Bedard is going to win, which is Virginia Pats. 
and um, he's how many have, points? Uh, Patrick and five points. So a hat trick mm. and two assists. Wow. Yeah. And they're just barely going to win. win. Yes. Um, it's just barely. Peter, <laughs> Peter, what are your thoughts? Who's going to win game seven here? <laughs> oh, okay. Who's going to win is going to be tough because, yeah. I mean, it, it's tied. It's going to game seven. It could go either way right now. Um, but if you want, you know, Connor Bedard has thrived in like game breaking moments. We've seen him in the past. We've seen him, uh, you know, you know, on that uh, penalty shot misses against Russia. And then he scores that wicked backhand, you know, at the top of the circle mm-hmm. at the U uh, 18s years back uh, during the pandemic, we saw him score that goal against Slovakia. Um, chances are he's made for big moments and this is no bigger moment for him than to keep his season alive. And if the over, if the betting is over or under, I'm not a betting man, but if it is over or under three points, I'm definitely taking the over on this one, oh, three yeah. points <laughs> because I mean, that's a safe bet, but like Matt, he can easily get four, five, six points. I I don't even know exactly like what his game by game stats are. So yeah. in of the six games, he's gotten three or more points four times. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. No, but so uh, take the over if you're willing to bet all that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's going to look ridiculously high, but still take the over. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, you know, I, we're joking a bit. I don't want to say that it's genuinely just Bedard because like Stanislav Spozel, Alexander Suzdalev yeah. have been great all regular season and really good in the playoffs, but Tanner genuinely well. like Tanner Howe as well. That's right. Um, but like, look at their team's uh, scoring in the playoffs <laughs> and it's Bedard with 19, Spozel, who's the top defenseman um, with 12, um, nine of those being assists. Um, and then Suzdalev has 11 points eight of which are assists um nobody has more than three goals on the team except Bedard who has 11 (laughs) he's been in on over three quarters of the team's goals in the playoffs so like he's he's running the show which is why uh my guess is that the Pats are going to win and he's going to have zero points (laughs) uh that's what happened in the gold medal game at the world juniors (laughs) if I remember correct Canada won gold and Bedard didn't score anything yeah. I think it's going to happen again. He's going to have his very rare off game and the team's going to bail him out. Um, I just really hope we get to see more Bedard in the playoffs. Uh, it's just exciting. We know he's first overall already, but it's just, oh, yeah. it'd be fun for him to be playing when the, uh, when the draft lottery comes around. Love to see Memorial cup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm nice. everyone would that'd be incredible. So, so I'm hopeful it keeps going. Um, Preferably with him scoring a lot of goals, but we'll see. <laughs> Maybe he can set some records. All right. Uh, so now we're going to wrap up the show as we love to do with our prospects of the week. Um, Matt, I'll come to you first this week. Who's your prospect of the week here? I got a two-headed prospect of the week. I This is both, and I'm staying with the Canucks. Um, just everyone knows this about me. I'll, I'll pick most of the time Canucks in this, so. Uh, Akito Hirose and Cole McWard are my two headed monster here. And, um, Hirose has been the more impressive one. Um, I mean, McWard's played a couple games. Hirose's played four, but Hirose has gotten a lot more ice time. And he's also playing in all situations. He's killing penalties. He's on the power play, second unit power play. Um, product of maybe because the Canucks defense is decimated. They don't have a lot, (laughs) but Hirose has been impressive. He, he's really reminding me of a Chris Tanev. He's got like, he may even be more an offensive. I think he'll probably put more points than Tanev in his career, but he's just got that calmness that defensemen need in the NHL. And he just doesn't panic. Uh, calm in the defensive zone makes the right play most of the time. I think he had, again, only four games, but he's played 20 minutes. He played 20 minutes in the last game, like 19 in the other one. Mm. Uh, and he has two assists. He had two assists, his first two assists against Chicago. Um, and yeah, uh, he's really impressed me coming out for the NCAA. Um, usually you don't have a lot. I mean, expectations for these guys because they don't obviously undrafted. Uh, but he was a high, he was a high, had a lot of interest around the NHL for this guy. So um, Canucks got him and he's, he's going to end up, I think he's going to end up being a really good NHL player. Um, very impressive. And Cole McWard's just been quietly climbing. He's, he's averaging about 13 minutes over the two games. Um, but he had his first NHL goal the other uh, yesterday. So 
open the scoring against the Flames and uh, just a quick wrist shot on goal and just found its way in. And that's all you really need. And almost had another goal in the game too. So I'm really excited to see these guys develop. I, I'm really surprised on how well they've acclimated to the NHL. So Hirose and McWard are my two uh, prospects of the week. Nice. Yeah, the Canucks have been doing real well for themselves the last 12 months or so with um, college and European free agents. Um, and also like guys that their contract or their, uh, their rights run out with yeah. NHL teams after not being signed or anything. Um, and yeah, they're in a good spot in the standings where they can give these guys real minutes and see what they've got in them. See if they want to bring them back. And yeah, Hirose especially has been very impressive early on here. Um, just on a one-year contract though. So we'll see uh, how long it takes for them to extend him for yeah. a couple more. <laughs> Peter, who's your prospect of the week this week? We joke about how the Vegas Knights really don't have prospects, but I am going to the Saginaw Spirit and picking Matias Shapovalov, the Ve- the Shapovalov, sorry, not to get confused with, you know, the tennis player because the pronunciation is kind of the same, but <laughs> they're 2022 <laughs> second round pick, uh, 48th overall. Um, having a really solid you know, sophomore season, um, you know, improved on his 52 points last season with 56, but the way that he's producing in the playoffs is absolutely phenomenal right now. Uh, 11 points in six games, um, known as more of a playmaker because of his ability to spot the lanes, but has kind of added a little bit more goal scoring to his game, both in the regular season and now 27 goals and five goals already in the playoffs right now. He's leading Saginaw and, you know, The way that he's producing right now is impressive because he's only had one game in their playoff series without a point. And he's been very productive, strong in the face off uh, circle, because that's his uh, that's one of his strengths of being aggressive in the dot, Um, winning face offs, winning puck battles and using his size to his advantage. I think this is. You know, again, we talk about Vegas not really having a deep prospect pool or one that's like kind of weaker compared to the other teams. Shapovalov is becoming a really how ho- really strong household name with this team because of the fact that you know they need some center depth right now they got that and he continues to impress so he is my prospect of the week nice yeah that that's a great pick he's been tearing it up almost two points per game in the playoffs there and and you're right that even though they we, we joke about their first rounders now they've only kept mm-hmm. one prospect they've taken um and not having the best prospect pool in the league, you know, you've got to get some wins on some mid round picks. You got to, you got to sneak out some talent. And it seems like, seems like they've done pretty well for yeah. themselves with yeah. Um, uh, My prospect of the week uh, is Leo Carlson. Um, you know, it's tough, you know, sometimes you don't want to pick the guys that are at the top <laughs> of the draft because people know a lot about them, but I just want to highlight what he's doing in the playoffs right now in the SHL in 12 games. He has nine points which is well above his scoring rate through the regular season, which was impressive, but this is yeah. much, much higher. Um, and I was, I was checking some stuff out, seeing uh draft draft year prospects in the SHL and some of its former iterations um, who have scored this many points in the playoffs to draft eligible. You've got Leo Carlson, you've got Daniel Sedin and Henrik Sedin. <laughs> Obviously these are not the same players at all, um, <laughs> but but Leo Carlson, uh, the only two players to have scored more playoff points as a draft eligible are the Sedin twins, um, <laughs> who both scored over a thousand points are already, they were first ballot, first ballot hall of famers. Um, and Carlson's right there with them. Just a couple more games and he could make it there. I'm trying to do some math real quick to see how his team's doing in the playoffs. I believe they're down three, two to Skeleftia in the SHL playoffs. So, you know, pressure's on a little bit, but if he can keep going, he can easily catch and, and maybe break those guys' records there. Uh, he's just been a, a, a really great player all year. Uh, mid, late first, a lot of people thought he'd be at the start of the season, but he's just been phenomenal in the SHL, earning a, a serious role in the middle six as a teenager. Um, two-way game. He's got the size. He's got the skill. He's really great around the net. And then he played at the World Juniors, and he was phenomenal for Sweden yeah. there as well. So uh, Leo Carlson is excellent. And just because his name isn't Adam Fantilli and Connor Bedard, 
uh, does not mean he's not going to be like a game changer for whichever team takes him. He's he seriously has the potential to be like an all star first line center for sure in the NHL. Uh, really exciting player. So Leo Carlson's my prospect of the week. Um, yeah, that does it for us this week. So thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Prospect Corner. Make sure you subscribe to the Hockey Writers YouTube channel to make sure you don't miss any more of our episodes. Also, make sure you check out our site, thehockeywriters.com, for tons of 2023 NHL draft coverage over the next few months. Make sure you check out Hockeypedia on thehockeywriters.com as well. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Matt. And thank you all for watching this week's episode of Prospect Corner. We'll see you next time.